must be someone stood there from the charity, like with their arms crossed, watching all of these people vomiting in buckets, going, oh, this event, I'm so proud of what we did. <laughs> so do bad is the, the next guest I, dis- I, I, I asked to come on the podcast because I've been referred to an old article they'd written where they were a 22 minute 5k runner and decided to just focus on the mile managed to get their time down to sub five minutes to give you a sense of that that is a 5k time slower than when i'm haven't trained at all to a mile time faster when i'm fully trained because i've 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 not broken what i've done five dead that's it um so he's he's come from behind to in front which is in itself incredible he writes for the new york and, and outside and huge amounts of great magazines in the states so we wanted to get him on to hear about his stories welcome to the podcast james bethia thanks. <laughs> thanks hey I, the the last name is buffet but that's okay nobody gets it right the first time oh wow like, um, almost <laughs> like right. uh is that from the simpsons buffet? <laughs> I, if it is, I hope so. I don't know if it is, but <laughs> isn't that Marge's um, Marge's maiden I've name? I've never, I've never heard that connection. But if that's true, I'm going to look it up. Um, but anyway, <laughs> anyway, buffet. Different. Yeah, yeah. Good to be, good to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. We um, we were chatting just before about um, the fact you worked for the New Yorker and outside. Like, what, how would you? Because we hear about those magazines through just the articles we read. But we don't really understand their place in the hierarchy of magazines in the states, or kind of who their listenership is, or what their focus is, or their history. How would you describe both magazines? Yeah, so I got my start at Outside Magazine uh, in my mid twenties. I just turned forty, um, and at the time, I think Outside was, and still to a degree, is regarded as like the the preeminent uh, sort of adventure magazine in the states. Um, where you find articles about topics like mountaineering and about mm-hmm. you know adventure kayaking and and different running sort of stuff, but written uh, I think in like sort of often literary sort of uh, style. So it's got mm-hmm. really really good quality writing, but about specifically about these uh, these sort of like um, outdoor subjects. And then the New York and they actually um, when I was there as a fact checker, I was becoming acquainted with the New Yorker magazine as well. And some New Yorkers writers were writing for outside. So you get an idea of like where they hope to be in terms of like um, the level of their of the quality of their writing. They were trying to, to do what the New Yorker does, which is it's regarded as, you know, some of the best magazine writing in the in the States, um, if not the English speaking world. Um, and I, you know, it was always my ambition to write for the New Yorker. and managed to sort of scrape my way there uh, over a long period of time, pitching and pitching. And, uh, and yeah, I've been working for The New Yorker now for uh, three or four years. And I, I've covered primarily politics in the southeastern United States, which is more um, because of uh, a need that they had for that kind of uh, reporting than that that was like the thing I really wanted to do. But mm. uh, as Trump became a big phenomenon, obviously, in the United States and the world and the southeastern United States was regarded as like a more important place to understand because of him and, and where his followers uh, come from um, or where they're predominantly uh, based. Uh, there was an interest in having me do some more reporting. So so that's what I sort of started off doing. And now I'm branching off into sort of other areas for them and um, doing more long form reporting and working on some. And how- yeah. What's the relationship between articles? The, the, uh, how many of them are, I guess, generated from your ideas and how many of them are ones where a magazine would come to you and say, can you write this for us? As I've gotten farther along in my career, fortunately, it's become more they come to me with, with ideas. Um, but as, an, as a freelancer for years when my, in my 20s and early 30s, the ideas had to all come from me. And that was often the mm-hmm. most exhausting and difficult part. Like I knew I could write a story. Uh, fairly well, but but finding an idea that hasn't been pitched before and that like <laughs> satisfies all the criteria, like that you know it's an important story to tell now. I have the access. Um, people are willing to talk to me, and I can pull it off for the the right budget. Like all those things, it's really hard to find uh, a topic where you can check all those boxes. And um, and so yeah, I, I've been able to have some success with that, but it's tough, man. Like it's people don't realize going into the, the magazine writing world, like 
being able to write is just one small small part of it. Mm. You really have to be sort of a salesman as well. So that's that's something that I had to figure out as I that went along. And of your kind of non running, non sporty articles, what which yeah. ones would you say you're you're most proud of and which ones are you most ashamed of? <laughs> ashamed. Uh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I had I, so before I worked for the New Yorker, but after I left Outside Magazine, I did. This is pretty heavy, but I wrote a story about the topic of assisted suicide. So in the United States, uh, every state has different laws regarding how you can end your life. If you can, if you can use a doctor to prescribe pills, if you have like a, a terminal illness, that's only legal in a couple states. So in most of the states, if people want to die, they've decided they're in too much pain. They have to find ways around the law. And I wrote about a guy who had uh, jaw cancer, who was in just a terrible amount of pain. And he found a group online called Final Exit that helps people like him decide how and when to end their lives. And I, I was able to go deep into, into his story and what motivated him um, and how, how and why he ended up making the choice he did, but also all of the, the complications that came with it and ultimately the legal uh, aspects of it, um, the people who helped him at Final Exit were ultimately charged with, uh, oh, okay. with with a crime. So that was a fascinating, as I said, heavy, heavy story, not one that I expected to bring up on this show. But, you know, mm. it's one I'm proud of because um, it's a topic that I think deserves more uh, scrutiny in the United mm. States. Uh, we don't really talk about death a lot. Well, I think globally. Not, not a fun does. topic. Globally, too, yeah. There are some mm. countries in Europe, though, that I think are more forward thinking, um, you know, the Netherlands and um, Belgium yeah, and places yeah. like that, Switzerland, yeah. So, yeah. And, yeah, and, so and in terms of the articles with, with the brought, you look back now and you think, oh man, I was desperate for a story there or, or anything. <laughs> well, well, well I mean, that. desperate for, okay, really desperate for a story. Month, uh... <laughs> yeah, 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 desperate for a story. Let's see, I wrote, so I was, I freelanced, as I said, a bit for Runner's World and um, I volunteered to run uh, an event called the Krispy Kreme Challenge, um, <laughs> which, are you familiar with Krispy Kreme? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you run two miles, you eat 12 donuts, and then you run two more miles. And so the question a lot of people wondered was, well, are your, is your, your split going to be better on the front end or the back end? Like, and I, most people would think, Was right, anyone like, wondering once, that? <laughs> <laughs> well, most people think that you actually, you're, you're heavier. Of course, you are well heavier. Thinking, isn't it? <laughs> the sugar, though, man, the sugar, I, my splits were about even somehow. Oh, really? Remar that remarkably. Fast? I don't, I can't explain it other than the sugar, um, but. Wait, wait a minute, this, this Krispy Kreme challenge, was it just invented by Krispy Kreme? Because <laughs> yeah, I've got to say, there's not much thought in it. You run Krispy Kreme <laughs> stuff in it. You, buy, you yeah. buy a dozen, eat them so, and run home. Like it's so it, the worst. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, I agree, it's a terrible ever. idea. I agree, but it's actually, uh, it is for charity. So a, a local uh, in Charlotte, North Diabetes. Carolina. Diabetes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, no, I know it's yeah. horrible. I don't know if they still do it, but uh, I mean, look, they apparently they raised a lot of money for some good causes or whatever. Um, and how many calories? Right. It makes a lot of people sick. I don't know if I ever looked it up. I mean, as like a as a skinny guy, I've never concerned myself too much with the calorie side of things. Yeah. Maybe I should now that I turned forty. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, all I can say is that like you know there were there were trash cans lining the course. That people were vomiting in as as they as they got into the back stretch, and I remember I didn't vomit, but I got back to my hotel room, lay down, fell asleep, and woke up, went into the bathroom, and and then there was like um, sugar crusted on my on my face, you know, from the donuts that hadn't quite made it all the way into my mouth. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. I do wonder. I do wonder. Like you, when they say like these things are for charity, there must be someone stood there from the charity, like with their arms crossed, watching all of these people vomiting in buckets, going, "Oh, this event! I'm so proud of what we've done. <laughs> this, this, this is what charity is all about." Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a very sadistic uh, and masochistic um, uh, event. Uh, I will say too, the thing that that, you, that one should know about Krispy Kreme donuts in particular, they're delicious, and and I've always loved eating them. That's part of why I signed up. I think was I thought, oh, enjoy these donuts, but there's a huge difference between the hot kind, fresh off the the the, the conveyor belt, that like melts in your mouth. It's so easy to eat, and then the kind that they served us 
were the kind that you find in, in gas stations. We only there. get those. Okay, so you haven't never had a good one. I'm sorry no. for that. Because they're actually, when they're fresh, man, they're really good. But what you, the kind that you probably, you're familiar with, like, they're very dense and hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. And like that's eating those is a completely different challenge, and um, yeah. I wasn't prepared for that. And I just remember <laughs> like watching people like ball them up, like just take all twelve and try to create like the most dense <laughs> thing, just try to jam it down their mouths. And and some people I think were like throwing them and pretend you know pretending they ate them. And it, it, yeah, you saw like a dark side of humanity there. I think. <laughs> yeah, my, my, I mean, be, my... oh, you there? Oh, yeah, we've got a bit of a wee cracking thing. Um, is, that, is that me or you? I don't know. That's me. It's me. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. 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 Was, was, yeah. That your was that your stomach grumbling? No, no. It wasn't. It's, uh, it's certainly not. It's certainly not. He loves my, cream. My sister, my, do you know, there used to be, there used to be a Krispy Kreme, um, like, factory um, and an outlet on the on the A10 in London, <laughs> which is in the weirdest place possible. And they used to do this <laughs> thing where they'd have a sign up to say that they were baking, and then they would have the stuff on the conveyor belt. And and I have had them when they've been fresh off the yeah. conveyor okay. belt. Okay, so, yeah. but my sister Pretty wanted good. a well, my sister wanted a promotion for Krispy Kreme, and she knew that I liked these Krispy Kreme donuts, and so she she brought me like a shopping bag, a plastic shopping bag full of Krispy Kreme donuts, and there must have been like. 30 donuts in this bag and i put into the thing and i'm like the just the the fact that these all these awful congealed donuts stuck together meant i never eaten a krispy kreme donut since i thought you were gonna yeah. say you ate them all i, th I thought made, this was gonna it, be your the shame idea where... that, the idea <laughs> with that it just it and that's how he began uh his competitive eating um life <laughs> 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 yeah no they're they're it's a whole different deal so i uh, i definitely took a few years off of those after the competition so were you often involved in running related like because runners world is I, I did they yeah. do they take runners on to the staff as writers so they take writers on and ask them to run i think i think it's easier to make a uh to bring a writer in and and sort of the writer can pretend as i did to be a runner Whereas it's harder for perhaps for some runners to pretend to be writers. Mm. That makes sense. Mm. Not not to I mean, say that some, running is easy. Some, some did very well, David. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, I'm not, I'm not pointing that. any fingers and some, at anybody. And, and some writers did a very bad job of pretending to be runners. So. Oh, for sure, for sure. I think I think with Runners World, though, as you all probably know better than I, like that magazine is not aimed at like the hot, like the the top com competing runners. It's aimed at yeah. like yeah. the average person. So better to have an average runner guy like me writing an article that's 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 more readily applicable absolutely yeah so you know and do they why. have like a how to fake being a runner type <laughs> checklist or it doesn't really work like that i didn't i didn't get that that report that that uh that email if they have one but um you know they, no they just want you to go out and tell the story warts and all i think that's what's interesting um there are the the, the more i guess they, they also run i haven't honestly I haven't read that magazine in a while but as I recall, you don't I mean, need to. You don't need to. You've read it already. So <laughs> it's right, the same. But it's a very successful magazine. I mean, there, mm. it's uh, you know, magazines are falling, falling off right and left, and yeah. Runner's World seems to be hanging on. So they're they're figuring something out. Mm. You know, there's a certain, and, uh, I guess, comfort in reading the same stuff. <laughs> well, yeah. What, what they, there is just a new runner constantly coming in that that seeks that advice as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Would you, with with this five minute mile idea, was this an yeah, idea yeah. of yours then? Was that something that someone suggested to you? No, that really was an idea of mine. I mean, it was, you know, a lot of magazine stories are contrived um, by mm. editors and pitch meetings, but I actually was, as I wrote in the story, which I, I have here and I reviewed because I was, uh, actually the truth is, so I told you I'm at my parents' house. My mm. mother keeps every magazine I've ever <laughs> written a story in. So, you know, so here, I, brilliant. <laughs> so like, oh, I was, well I was done, literally, man. I was sitting at the toilet like hours ago, and uh, and I just reached down, and I and I saw this, <laughs> and I said, well, this must be a magazine that I have a story in, but I didn't yeah. know which one. I had no idea. Brilliant. And I opened it up, and like, you know, this is before I remembered I had to talk to you guys. And so, is is that best trips article on the front? Is that drug trips or is that actual <laughs> God, it'd, be, trips? it'd be a more interesting um, issue if it were drug trips. 
Um, but but no, but to your question, I mean, I I I really was uh, I wa I was watching the Olympics. I guess this was six five six years ago, and was just like mm -hmm. you know inspired as one sometimes is watching the Olympics and. Not that I was inspired enough to try to be an Olympian, but was like, you know what? Like, I kind of have a runner's body, sort of. I definitely don't have a bo like a football body, so uh, I wonder what I can still get out of it because I've 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 done some things in my life um, athletically that have been ambitious, but none of them has been running at this point, at that mm -hmm. point. And um, but I've I've I'm the sort of person who like likes a challenge and likes to take on work, and uh, so I just. Like, what the hell? Let's just try to run a five minute mile. And as I said, like, six minute mile, you know, that seems too pedestrian. 530 is mm. too weird. Like, five, five minute mile, that's like a real, that's something you can hang your hat on. Um, and, and I wasn't certainly going to run faster than that. Is it a known, would people at school or at college have tried and have an idea of what a good time is? Or is it still quite a new? concept for people to to grasp what their time would be um i mean i didn't like i said in the story i i had never run a, a, a timed mile on a track before i was i was like a tennis player or soccer player so i'd done plenty of like running around but i'd never like timed myself and i had like a vague idea that a five minute mile was a good time i knew i knew roger banister in the four minute mile like obviously that's not me um, but, mm. but like, you know, add a minute and you start to get into like something that's doable for a guy who's stubborn and maybe semi-athletic. Semi and I felt like those two things I was, or I am. And, um, so I talked to my friend, Will, sorry, that's my dog. I talked to my friend, Will, um, who was, who had our high school record in the 5k. He ran a 1620 and he was like, yeah, you could probably do it. You know, and I was like, well, okay, man, like but you ran like what is what is a 1620 breakdown to like that's mm. you were running like low five minute miles on like grass on hills in the rain you know like i don't know how that translates to me and uh but he was right like he he knew that i had enough enough juice to get close to it and, and ultimately I, I did have to hire a coach that's really interesting because really i'd have if, if you'd have come to me i'd have said no if, like, if, if... <laughs> Just even at, because I go yeah. to, or when I wasn't injured, I I go to a track and you, I, I think the general assumption of most runners, particularly when you go to clubs or you see your friends doing different distance races, is that someone who's faster, the, the one mile is kind of the same position in the field at the 5K and the 10K and the half marathon and the marathon and the only times that differs is if someone hasn't trained as much as the others for the marathon or if someone's really focused on the shorter distances but one mile in my mind is a long enough distance that actually you can't really in my head become really good at it without just being really good at all running so um so yeah that that's i don't know i mean probably... I, it was not easy like it took me six months and you know i was and i hired a coach and all that and i got the best gear but mm. I, I guess i should give myself a little credit like i'm not a fat slob i'm not a slouch mm. like I, I have something i have some some small amount of like running ability in me um that's that that was proven i guess but but to, you and know you... like i I know guys too who can just go out who are like the next level who ran mm. you know seriously ran track in high school or college and like without training they go out and bust out a 445 or something that's something mm. I'll never do so I understand my place in the scheme of things and and when you pitch the idea to yeah. to the magazine do they do they have to believe as well? Like, was this an article that you needed to run sub five, do you think, to, to be a good article? Or? That's a great question. And I should look back at the emails. I'm sorry I can't give you a firm answer, but I, yeah. I bet that they would have been hesitant to run it if I'd never gotten there. I mean, I, you know, my <laughs> writing's good enough. I could have written like a fun little thing about how I almost but not quite did it, um, which might have served some entertainment purpose. But for, for the true inspiration that I think that they they wanted out of the article, yeah, I had to I had to bust through five. Um, what's interesting uh, uh, is that this article I've written, you know, uh, I didn't I did give you a very vague idea of what I've done in my career, but I've written a lot of things about a lot of topics 
this is the article, this five minute mile article that I still, to this day, probably once a month, get an email from a random person about. Like I wrote this thing so long ago in a magazine that is a big magazine, but not the biggest in mm. the United States. Mm. And it's always dudes in their thirties or, or like head and close <laughs> to 40 who are like, you know, they're, they're like, so, um, how, like they want me to, they, they want me to break down like, like the little, and I'm like, I don't remember. Like, I can't tell you what I ran on a Tuesday nine years ago, but like, mm. I can, I can be here to say that I'm not a guy who was like a, 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 like a great high school athlete. I'm a guy who is stubborn and like not fat and I guess has a little more speed than I thought. And, mm. uh, you know, I trained myself and you can train yourself too. And like, I really, I get calls all the time. I thought about just starting to, to monetize it somehow. Well, yeah. you've got to, all you got to remember is that some of those 40 year olds um, just yeah. go a little bit further and have podcasts that they. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I should, I, 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 should, I should spin the article into a podcast and run you guys out of business. <laughs> yeah. yeah, do it, do it. Well, you, you can't run a, anyone out of business that doesn't have a business. So. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. But here's, a, here's, another we... funny, here's another funny thing, though, about the story. Like, so I was working with an editor who was a bit younger than me. And I didn't know him terribly well, but I, you know, I, I knew he was like an athlete, had an athletic background. After the story was done, I was like, so, so Matt, do you think, do you think you could do this? Kind of thinking he'd say like, nah, no way. And he's like, very, very like deadpan. He's like, well, actually I've run a 436. And I was like, oh shit, like you are, you're a real runner. <laughs> like, kept that one quiet. Yeah, he's just a real humble, humble guy. He didn't want to, or he didn't want to like, I guess, make me feel. No, no, not humble, waiting for that moment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. exactly, that, yeah. exactly. He knew it was process. coming. He was buying Maybe both. time. Maybe both. He could be both, you know. I think he's, he's, he's a, he, he is, he actually is a pretty, he's a pretty humble dude, but you're right. He probably was savoring the potential moment. <laughs> Um, did he so well then when once you decided once he had the green light on the article how you what you decided to focus on and how you broke down what you were going to do did, sorry did he now, did, do, you, do you recall how you like how you just what you decided yeah. to focus on and how you right. broke down what, what your plan was yeah, I mean, I didn't start off super strategically. I just remember having a conversation with, a, uh, I was talking, well, at the time I had written another story for Outside about this um, this runner's forum called Let's Run, uh, what is it, yeah. Let's Run? Yeah, Let's, Let's run. run, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had written like this long piece about those guys who started the brothers Wojo and uh, Robert Johnson and like their their whole team and their approach. And um, His name's and... Wojo Johnson. Yeah, yeah. That's a great name. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, um, I like that in itself. Sorry, it's just exciting so, enough so, to me to. <laughs> <laughs> so those guys, so like there was some interest in the, bu in the book publishing world of, of, of a book about those guys and that site. So I was talking to an agent about that and nothing ever came of, of that uh, idea. But the, the agent mm. was himself a former college runner. And he was like, look, man, if you want to run a five minute mile, you just need to like just start clicking off like 74 second 400s in your sleep. And so I was like, okay, all right. I don't really have a track to go to nearby, but I'll go to, I'll go to the treadmill and just do like 74. I'll put it at, you know, 459 or five minutes in the treadmill and just start banging out like 400s. And so that was literally what I did. Like I just got on a treadmill and was doing like 400s on a treadmill with a little bit of rest in between trying to see if I could ultimately like, you know, shrink the amount of rest and get closer and closer to like just putting them together. But could you obviously, do the first like, one? huh? Could you do the first time you tried it? I'm gonna say probably not quite uh, or close. Like it would have killed me, but I probably got close to doing one. Um, mm. But but you know, then I was I sat back and I was smart enough to know like, well, maybe I should sprinkle in some longer runs here, <laughs> right? Like get some actual like distance mm. in. So I started doing that, but it was all very haphazard. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and I think I got down, you know, to like a 515, 520 through just this, that haphazard approach, but like mm -hmm. that nearly, that nearly killed me. So I ended up hiring, um, Nick Willis, the, uh, the, the Kiwi 1500 runner who had just, oh, yes. who, who had, I don't know how many gold medals he has. He's got a gold or <laughs> maybe a bronze actually. 
but he's a medalist. He's an Olymp he's an Olympian um, who is long in the tooth now and uh, starting a he was just starting his Myler Method uh, program online, his virtual coaching program. Mm. And so I was like one of his first guinea pigs. The timing was just really fortuitous, and he 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 probably chuckled as I think when I started when I sort of gave him a version of what I just told you. It was like, man, what are you doing? Like, you need to be. <clears throat> we need you to to do like two weeks of like distance training or like just putting in miles, like long mileage, and then we're gonna do two weeks of speed training. And then I don't know what the fifth week was, but it was like a five week plan. And he just just through conversations and knowing like my age, my height, my weight, uh, the shoes I wore, the, the trip and like some of the race times and and practice trial runs, like what I had done, he pretty quickly like honed in on who I was as a runner and what I needed to be running. And uh, and he got me to, you know, he got me there. Like it was incredible. It was it, I'm not on here to, to to tell people to go join his Myler Method clinic, but like it worked for me. Because um, how, uh, how long from when you started that to your, yeah. was it your first attempt that you managed it or? Uh, so let's see. I mean, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to try to be as accurate as possible. This is a while ago. Um, so I got down to like a 515, 520 on my own after like three or four months of just mm. the treadmill stuff. <laughs> and, <laughs> and were you doing uh, anything else around that were you changing your diet were you resting late yeah i was back off booze, i wasn't I, I had stopped drinking but i i still smoked weed i was i like <laughs> the cbd you know no, no yeah. other reason <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's one thing that i've it, it, i mean it's frankly it's, it was great for recovery for me but also it's just part of my like it just keeps me it keeps me square up here um so uh, I mean, I was, I, I think I was probably eating a little bit better going, I was getting more sleep. That was really critical. Like mm. sleeping eight, eight, nine, ten 10 hours. If I could get it was like big for me. I just was so tired. And that was one of the reasons that after this was all over, I was, I kind of took a break for a little while is because it, it was really depleting. Like my body, you know, handled it, but I don't know that I'm meant to be like a, uh, a guy who runs 60 mile weeks. Like that's a mm. lot in your body after a while. I don't know what you guys are doing, but um my my body my mid 30s was like cool with that for a little while and then was like let's just go back to normal um and then find sort of a happy medium but uh yeah i don't i don't think i did anything dramatically different but i just i felt like 520 was a wall like i i, I was hitting a wall there mm -hmm. and i needed some actual strategy to get beneath that and so nick came in and i think what i did was i just upped my mileage and started doing 30 40 plus mile weeks, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot for probably some of your listeners or whatever, but for me, I'd never probably run more than 40 miles in a week uh, or more than 50. And so getting comfortable with that was big. And uh, and then he kind of had me, he sort of started tailoring like very specific like numbers I was targeting. Like you need to run five miles at a 615 pace and you need to do, you know, these tempo runs. Um, mm. And so he had me at five weeks of very specific um, numbers targeted training uh, that I did after upping my mileage a bit. So it was we probably like anything, two months. Were more. you doing power or anything like that, doing any weights? Are we doing faster sprints than the, the 74 seconds or? Um, yeah, I was doing some faster for sure. I was doing like 200s and 300s and 400s. Um, mm. uh, or, yeah, and I was doing those, you know, the shorter ones where I was doing it closer to like a four minute mile pace. Um, mm. I mean, what, one thing that like he told me that was good when I first started talking to him was that I I, I had discovered that I do have like pretty good speed. And um, so, for instance, when I had gone out uh, before I started working with him I, and did my 520, I ran that first lap in a 60 in 66 seconds. Which is crazy Ooh, if, you're, if you're trying yeah. to run a five minute mile, like that's way yeah, off, yeah. way off, like 10 seconds too fast. Yeah. And so he's like, well, the good thing is like, he's like, you don't know how to pace yourself, but like you, you actually have some speed. So mm. that's good. And so um, uh, I don't know where I was going with that, which you just asked me, but like, um, yeah, I, run like fa I was able to run fast at shorter distances and sprinkling in some of that with the distance work was important. But for me, 
the the bigger like absence was the the like volume training. Mm. I needed more just time out there running slow. Building so then the endurance. The attempt itself then what yeah. happened there like we, we was it part of a a running celebration that was happening or was it just you on a track by yourself with people it was me on, or? it was me on a high school track uh near my house that i had that i was sort of not supposed to be using but had been using <laughs> <laughs> and like i went there and i uh yeah i had a, i had somebody there who was you know checking the watch and shouting out my my quarter mile uh times and who watched me you know, losing my mind and sort of like grunting out of control towards the end. But um, yeah, and also there for support, but just proof, right? Like proof that I did it um, mm. beyond my stopwatch. And uh, I was able to hit, I think it was like 76, 73, 76, 74, something like that. So it was like, it was much more even. Um, mm. And it, the, I remember it being really hard to to go out. It felt so slow going out at 76, like, um i had to really like restrain myself because all of the just you know you want you want to just rush out and do it right and yeah and that actually was an, that that the difficulty of pacing oneself is something that i uh, a subject that i followed up with um in another article when it, when i was imagining whether usain bolt could run a sub five mile i wrote about that for the mm. new worker later and it, and uh i don't oh, know if you guys want to actually yeah, yeah, that's me. I, I, did, I, I didn't piece. realize. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's go there as well. well first that's thing, an interesting uh, one to talk about. We'll, yeah. we'll, we can just discuss that in a second. But with the, so when you then did the five mile, were there any people that, that hadn't believed you that were surprised you'd done it? And how did you, did it change how you felt about yourself? I mean, no, I think everybody was like, well, finally he fucking did it, you know? Like, <laughs> talking about it for like six months. <laughs> um I was I was just out there for so long, uh, and I, I'd lost you know I'd lost a little noticeable weight. Like I went from skinny to very skinny, you know. Mm. And uh, <laughs> so people were like, "All right, is this is this worth it? Like, is he going to do it?" But I, I don't know. I think like most that you talk to who aren't terribly familiar with running, they're gonna they're not going to be all that like shocked or surprised. Like, oh, five minute mile. Like they don't know the difference between five minute mile and six minute mile. Mm. They don't. It's not really understood. Like four minute mile maybe they have some concept of that of how crazy that is because of banister or whatever yeah. but like a five minute mile there's not a lot of yeah i just don't think people know what it really takes so when i did it there wasn't yeah. this huge surprise it's not like i ran like a you know i don't even know what the equivalent would be like what do people really understand like normal people uh, even a 5k I, th I think any people know because of park run i think outside of that people wouldn't have a clue if 13, 14, 15, 16, yeah. 17, 18, even 20, yeah, yeah. I think. Yeah. It's um, 10K, maybe some awareness, and but marathon's probably the only distance that people truly understand. Right, yeah, yeah. There's not a lot of education there or exposure, mm -hmm. so. Um, but yeah, I mean, how, how did it, I, I mean, it was like, it was pretty cool uh, as a, as like a, um, a, a validation of like internal strength or whatever, um, because it, mm -hmm. you know, it wasn't a reflection of like some great athletic ability. Like I do think I have some, but it was more a testament to just work, just putting in work, like mm. regular work for six months, and I was able to do it. You know. Um, and have you? And, did you? Did yeah. did it give you a a joy of running, and that has led to other things, or was it? Did you close that chapter as a thank God that's over? Well, I mentioned this a, a little while ago that I, that, you know, I'm not built for 50 mile weeks, but like, I definitely, I stayed uh, a consistent runner and, and I've fallen a bit off during the pandemic. I've gotten more into mountain biking, but, uh, but no, like I, it did like awaken in me, like a sense of like, what is, what running is, what it requires and like the chemical feedback that it gives you, which is mm. fantastic. And, and it's, mm. I have leaned on it to get me through some, some challenging periods and uh i think i'll continue to be like a, a um a semi-regular runner for the rest of my life probably which is mm. which is cool like i always kind of i was never into it growing up but this this definitely like changed my relationship to it oh that's uh, in great a cool, in a cool way yeah so yeah. then do you think um can you beat the fastest man in the world of five five uh <laughs> a, a mile then that's the big question he's saying bolt 
Um, I mean, you know, obviously if Usain Bolt like decided he was going to train to run a five minute mile, of course he could do it. But the question, the question that was posed in that article was like at his height as a hundred meter, 200 meter runner, if you just say like, in a moment, mm. like, okay, we're going to go run, like, a five-minute mile right now. Like, mm. let's go. Can, can you do it? Like, he'd, of course, he'd say yes, but then he would go out way too hard. He's never, as I came to learn, he has never run a timed mile. He's literally never he... run one. So he doesn't know what that feels like, and he's going to mm. go way too hard. He'll probably crush the first, you know, the first half mile in, like, two minutes or something. And, and then somewhere in that third lap, and this is not just my speculation, like I was talking to all sorts of like experts in the running world, including the guys at Let's Run, who are these twins who are divided on the question themselves. But it's, uh, the thinking was probably, uh, I think more people thought that he would ultimately go out too hard and his, his legs would just, you know, fill up with lactic acid like I did at the beginning of the LA Marathon. Mm. <laughs> and, uh, and he would just, and he would just, you know, he would, he would break himself somewhere in that third or fourth lap and uh, come in just, just after five minutes. That'd be so good to see, wouldn't it? That'd It'd be, be amazing, right? Thing. Yeah. Like, get him and Mo Farah out there or something. <laughs> It'd be amazing. Especially because he's, he's one of those people that you'd imagine he would fight like hell. Yeah. Once that lactic's in his body, he'd be running in a style that just looks horrific because he physically <laughs> yeah, can't right. use some of that because he wouldn't want to lose. He wouldn't want to lose yeah. the bet. It's nothing and his to body like heroes in pain out of out of water, <laughs> you know, just doing something. But there, there is something in that, isn't there? There is something in you know what would happen, like you know, as an experiment. I, I, I just think that would be incredible to see. It really would. I mean, somebody should put the money up. I, I don't think he's hurting for money, but if he ever is, maybe he would bite. Um, but, you know, it's it's, the, it's also the fast twitch, slow twitch muscle thing. Like, he's developing an entirely different, just an entirely different system. I'm not a scientist. So I'm not going to try to break it down. But, like, sprinters are using an entirely different system than long-distance runners, mm. right, or middle-distance runners. And so, you know, his body is just not ready for – the challenge of a, of a middle distance race. but even even the way he runs my i was speaking to a friend danny this weekend and he's he was an, an analyzed look at his long distance running um technique and they said that the way he runs when he runs at 400 meters is actually completely different strides and his muscle engagement to when he mm. runs longer and I'd, you'd imagine someone like saying, Bolt, he's so trained into driving from the floor out of the blocks into like that direct straight angle of power that it's probably not the same gait or running yeah. um, that he'd yeah. use in a longer distance race. So it might actually be counteractive towards helping in longer distances. That, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I do remember um, finding a video on YouTube, an old one of Carl Lewis, the sprinter, the mm. American sprinter, mm. um, in some sort of a promotional uh, half mile race. So an 800 meter race with like some NFL players. This was this was right around the time that he was at the t at the peak of his abilities. And so you see, you see kind of a, a, a shortened version of what it might look like with Usain Bolt, because Carl Lewis goes out way too hard, and I think he he may end up winning or almost winning the race, but like his second lap and the second half of the second lap, yeah, he, it's like it's like a dramatic shift where he his legs just you can see start to get really heavy on him, and I think mm. he I think he finishes in like two fifteen two twenty, which really isn't. That's that's not all that impressive, right? Like two two ten, two fifteen, yeah. whatever it was. Like that's a slow time for Carl Lewis. Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. what do you think Carl Lewis would do? And actually, the crossover between influencers and um, and the fact that major running stars are no longer being sponsored in the same way, it might actually be that we see more of these crazy challenges. You know, the Red Bull style events where we get the best people in the world desperate for attention to increase their followings doing challenges that aren't just the simplicity of are you the fastest pe person in the world at 100 200 5k whatever it may be but who knows maybe in the future it. this will be commonplace 
I just want to say right now, like Usain Bolt, if you're listening, like I'm, 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 I'm ready for you. Like I, uh, I, I didn't mention this earlier, guys, but I, so I just, I did just turn 40, and I am trying to see if I can run a sub 530 mile to see if I still have that in me without I really having I, trained. And I, I think I, I think should be. I think you should go sub five again. I don't think. Uh, I don't, it, it, like, man, it just took just so a much number. work. It just took so much work. Get uh, into that shape and then do the Krispy Kreme challenge. That would be good. <laughs> yeah, but I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen pictures of you saying, I bet he's a little heftier, heftier now than he was a few years ago. But so, you know, so, so are all of us, I guess. Really he's got to be. Now, you mentioned before we, we started recording that you, uh, you like myself, uh, have, we're both called Charles, my middle, my middle name. We've both led big marathons. So, um, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I thought you were going to say, we were both, I was, I was going to say, we're both uh, writers. I was going to go, hmm. <laughs> no, I'm not claiming that one. That was a long time ago. That, that week or two of. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'd like to see. I'd like to see what you produced. But um... you, both have a, you both have a healthy disrespect for um, uh, elite athletes uh, you hmm. know, trying to trying to achieve something. So I think that's that's pretty impressive. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I definitely, I definitely. So yeah. So I, I this was. Uh, um, I don't, I don't know, six, seven, maybe eight years ago, probably eight years ago, um, I got uh, in touch with some folks. I think it was with ASICS, and ASICS was sponsoring the LA Marathon. Does that sound right? Yeah. And um, and they were basically outfitting a few writers, a few average runner writers with shoes to go run the marathon and then write something about it. And I thought, like, I was open to it, definitely wanted some free shoes, but um, was like not sure what would be interesting to write about. Um, just running the marathon seems sort of, you know, mind Isn't that a classic band trying to just think, why don't you write about what we want you to write about, not thinking about any of the readers at all? Isn't that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's very funny. much. So. That's funny, because when, when I did that, A6, A6 took me to Paris Marathon, and they, they did exactly the same thing. They kicked you out and everything. And I ran it, yeah. and I said, worst marathon I've ever run. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, you know, at some point I was like, well, I think I came up with an idea on my own. Like, why don't I, can you guys get me to the front of the pack? And like, I'll see if I can hang with those guys. I'll see how long I can hang with those guys. And then write about like, you know, the horrible things that ensue after that. So A6 knew? Oh yeah, they, yeah, they knew. I mean, I'm, well, shit. I assume they, I, this is, I, I should go back and check. I'm pretty damn sure they knew because I think I, I leaned on them to get the access to the front of the pack. There was no mm. way for me to do that without them. I think I Did had you have to that. walk out to your name and all of that? And <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I, um, I just remember, I remember being just sort of like put, you know, pushed to the front and, and, and somebody saying like, That's don't, don't. daring for a brand. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Quite ballsy. I was well, ten years ago. If it's ten years ago, maybe not. Yeah. Maybe because everyone's very safe now, aren't they? So. I mean, I should say when I say the front, like I, I wasn't like the literal first guy. Like mm. you know, there was this little cluster of the Ryan Halls and those guys from East Africa who were like actually at the very front, and then I was yeah. maybe started like five yards behind them. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So I don't want to Paul, paint a picture of me literally at the very front, but I was close, <laughs> close, close enough to like, you know, say, hey, Ryan, what's up? And I actually did. Um, the best thing that came out of this whole race for me was not the $500 I got paid for that story and all the hate mail that it that it uh, it led to because, you know, it, like, did your really? stunt, did your did, did that happen for you? Like serious runners were like, you're disrespecting, you're disrespecting the marathon. Well, no one knew who I was because I, well, partly because no one does, but also <laughs> it, <laughs> but it was, I just did it for a challenge for, um, for charity. And so amongst my friends. Krispy, for Krispy Kreme or? Oh, that would be good. Yeah. That's why I stopped. So that's the only reason I didn't win it because I uh, pulled over on the side. So amongst my friendship group, everyone knew about it, but actually yeah. outside of that, I didn't write about it and it, it wasn't. It was picked up by I think talk talk one of the radio stations who who said some idiots running with the front runners that was about it and then it was mentioned in a book to do with trying to break sub two but outside of outside 
um, I don't, there wasn't really a forum for people to feed back, um, although they did change the rules of London so that the... Um, <laughs> because of you. Yeah, which is, it's just, well, you've just been a bit, been a bit you, bad. You've changed that, the world. Well, yeah, for, in, in a really minor, annoying way, which is, I guess, <laughs> it's this kind of very, very true assessment of my personality. But, um, yeah, so now if, if you've got the elite and then the, the championship, which who are the, the kind of t sub 245 runners, they have to start with clear distance between them, whereas previously it would, you'd just go up behind them. So they've tried to make it right. harder. But actually, you know, if I get my place, if I get fit again, I'm going to go for it um again because what, what, what is your think, what is your pr your marathon um pr i've done 244 i think if i had with the trainers and actually if i was properly trained i could do mid 230s but who knows um so but you'd i think you could still lead it with a 60 seconds 400 meters which is eminently doable so so wait yeah. so, so wait 244 that's what's the mile the mile pace there it's like uh mid, that'd be six, low, low mid fives or no. No, no, like six fifteen. Okay. Six fourteen to six six fifteen, depending right, on how aggressive hang. your cornering is. I can hang with you for three or four miles there. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. But um oh so so yeah. um was it all serious writers then who so serious runners who were uh, writing to you and giving you this grief? Yeah, I didn't really look up their backgrounds. You know, it, it was just mm. like the comment section beneath the article was full of vitriol mm. for, for, for the guy who, you know, <laughs> who used his connections to take his, like, very modest, uh, you know, if, if that running ability to the front of the pack. I, I, you know, I understand, like, the idea that you should, that people want you to earn, they want you to earn that uh, position. But, you know, so it's one, the fact that you've been given your place, you think? Yeah, 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 the, totally. And then, and that, like, clearly yeah. I was not a runner. I mean, because by the end of the article, like, you know, I'm, I'm like, every – first I'm hanging with the guy, the, the runner who's holding the, like, six-minute pace sign, and then it's the <laughs> 6.30 pace sign, then the seven – and, like, I work my way down to, like, you know, like the eight-minute pace sign or <laughs> whatever. And so it's pretty clear to the reader that, like, this guy didn't deserve to be there. <laughs> and, like I said, I think I could have run a 3:30, but like you know, I, yeah, I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not, a, I'm not a great marathon runner. But, um, the, but the great thing that, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. Well, I was just gonna say that like a great thing did happen. Actually, I've never really told this story to any podcast um, or anybody much other than a few friends. Like at so at that same marathon, I was Asics also sponsored Ryan Hall, mm -hmm. and they. Uh, they gave me like half an hour with him to talk to him and he and I kind of like struck struck a nice rapport and I ended up um, spending like another few hours with him like driving around LA and doing things and like we had like some nice very open interesting conversations mm. in which he actually more or less revealed in a, in a perhaps more candid way than he ever had before that he was just sort of like over it he was just kind of over like marathon running competition. Mm. Like his mind was, he was more interested in like spirituality and God and like, like winning. He said in some ways that I'm not, I can't, I can't tell you verbatim how he put it to me, but the article, you know, quotes him on this. He just sort of said things that were re remarkable for a guy of his ability and, and who had succeeded mm. at the level that he had, that was just sort of like, kind of like, fuck it basically. And so my, I wrote an article about that as well for the New Yorker. And that was one of my very first New Yorker stories. And that story kind of what like sort of cracked open the door for me there. And I've kind of been working with him ever since. Did so, that get Ryan into trouble? Cause yeah, it did, it did get him into some trouble. If you recall. Yeah. It was probably my article that was the biggest part of it. Cause he dropped out of that marathon too. Mm. Um, so, you know, and, I mean, you, you all know his story as well or better than I do, but I just sort of no, fell we, into we don't the really, last because, chapter. Because Ryan almost, we've been podcasting for about six, seven years. So Ryan is someone okay. we know of, and we know of him now mainly, because, partly because of his wife, partly because he's just such a huge like training beast, which is amazing. Um, but his, his place in American history and his his – path of marathon running is is something that's a bit before our time our consciousness because we were 
we knew the UK stuff, but not the US stuff. I mean, he, he ran, and I'm not, I, I, unfortunately, if I had, if I had like known we were going to talk about him, I would have looked back on this stuff a bit more. But mm. I mean, I, I do know that like he came out of nowhere and in his first marathon, I want to say he ran like a 204 or 205 or six or something like that. That sounds crazy. about right. Yeah. Like he just debuted with this in, insane time that just set mm. the expectations so high for him in his career. And he more, and he really never, he never was able to, to like satisfy the expectations that he set with that run. He, he had a few other very nice races, mm. um, but he was just immediately sort of like, you know, crowned essentially as like the, the next great American marathon runner. And the fact that he was like a white guy from yeah. you know, the Midwest or whatever, it just in blonde and, or from California, I think like blonde and just, he had this sort of all American sort of look to him that I think made him really appealing and interesting to people who were yeah. potentially as interested in, in marathons before. And, and so I sort of just caught up to him at sort of the very tail end of his career where I essentially put a microphone in front of him, right. And he was ready to say, fuck it. <laughs> and like, and ASICs just set ASICs just sort of enabled me to be there for that moment, which is amazing. It was a so, it, it, disaster, a disaster for ASICs, this, uh, <laughs> this uh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Stuff, like, the, the, main, the main sponsor uh, athlete is quitting. This is absolute, it yeah, goes down yeah. as their most disastrous uh, press <laughs> trip ever. <laughs> right. I know, they, they haven't called me back, but. Um, and did, know, did you ever, have you been in touch with him since, do you know, whether he, you do wonder of an article like that, whether in in hindsight he'd have been frustrated that it was published or whether it was exactly what he wanted i don't you know i don't know his manager i think his manager said something to me in the days or weeks afterwards that indicated that the manager was frustrated but like i don't know ryan was just i mean i had literally had a microphone next it, there was no like surprise element here like i'm a reporter mm. with a microphone we're having like a very nice natural conversation about him and his life and his motivation. And he, we're looking each other in the eye and he's telling me his thoughts and I'm telling him I'm writing a story. So I don't, you know, I don't know how he could be mad about me essentially. Yeah. Like I just quoted him. I really just quoted mm. him. I wasn't like, fuck this guy. Cause I didn't, I have no agenda. I don't, I'm, yeah. I, I didn't buy into him needing to be anything. I just thought he was yeah. an interesting individual. And, um, and so his, you know, his quotes were what they were. And I think depending on who you are in the running world, you'll read them different ways. I read them as kind of radical and, and kind of cool. Like, we, you, you don't really doing his own thing. It's not often that you hear a story of a, like a, a gifted person who is right on the cusp, not, not giving enough. Like you hear people of who, of who rebel or who never right. got there, but for someone like him to be, because all runners work incredibly hard it's different to other sports where you'll get like a football star who's top of top goal scorer in the league just because he's talented and he's still got his belly whereas because all runners train incredibly hard by the nature of what it takes to get quicker i think there is an element of almost resentment or anger for people who've got so much talent that don't just do that do the yeah. little bit that you're you're doing 60 miles a week 80 miles a week and you're working full time. I think there is a little, a little bit of jealousy and annoyance that someone could be so good and isn't prepared to do just a tiny bit more than what you're doing already. Right. Um, I, I totally understand that criticism, but you know, his, his position is like, I'm living my life for me. And you know, mm, I, yeah. look, I, I recognize I'm really good and I have these gifts, but like, I'm not happy doing this thing anymore. Yeah. And like, yeah. I kind of think that's it's a it's a it's a radically individualistic thing for an athlete to say because athletes are supposed to like do all this stuff for their sponsors, their coaches, their audience, etc. Yeah. But he'd done that for a while and like you know, so I understand the criticism, but I also thought it was cool for him to finally just put his foot down and say like I'm going to yeah. do some other stuff and you know, and I haven't checked back in with him. But I I remember seeing pictures a few years ago of him like getting into bodybuilding kind of. And He's now he, massive. Yeah. Is, Massively so, strong, yeah. Like upper body. Oh, he is he is an absolute beast, and he's loving yeah. it. He's clearly found a passion for just yeah. working out again. Um, and 
he would be an amazing follow-up article because yeah. he's he's a bit too big and also i don't know him so i don't, I don't know how to get yeah. him on the podcast but I, i'd love to because the, yeah. the fact that he's he was so super skinny when he was a runner yeah and now you wouldn't you would assume they're two different people yeah, I mean, I, I could uh, try to dig up the contact for his manager and see maybe just don't drop my name. <laughs> yeah, or just just do an article <laughs> yourself. If you wanted to, is, yeah, do an article yeah. yourself because it it would be a great yeah. article, and and actually the running community I think are all quite fascinated by it. From what I can yeah. gather, that's from a good Instagram. idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. It's a good idea. I would love to at least uh, do a little workout with him. See if I could. Yeah. I couldn't. Yeah. I, I couldn't. I couldn't chase him down. Now I probably can't lift as much as I'm sure I can't lift as much as he lifts. Is he doing? You like, to run huge faster life? than him now. That would be a good challenge. <laughs> uh, you now that he's what probably 16 stone or so. And and so do what you? What is that? What is 16 stone? Oh. Um, you know what that converts to? We're we no talking like 200 idea. pounds or something. No, how well, I'll do a quick giggle. Sorry, listener, but this is <laughs> just, this is worth knowing. Curious. Brian Hall, wait, gotta be on. Oh, so he used to be sixty-one kilograms. That clearly is old. Um, see, I don't, he can now deadlift more than five hundred pounds. Wow! And squats four seven five. So that was April twenty-one. I think he's bigger since then. Good lord! Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, and, and now that you're, because you mentioned how you're with the New Yorker, and I, th I think this is before we were recording as well, you're, through the nature of the work they needed to be done, um, the articles, you, you do a lot more kind of Southeastern American politics. Uh, where do you see, given that the, the type of things we've talked about are more um, lifestyle, kind of slight oddities to do with, with individuals, very different to to a polit political slant, like where, where do you see your articles taking you? And do you think you've got any more interesting running stories in you? I would love to. I mean, I think I'm always fascinated just by, by profiles of, of interesting people and they could be athletes, they can be politicians, whatever. Mm. I think it doesn't so much matter um, who they are as long as they're complicated and, and there are stakes and there's some drama attached and their characters, you know, like I, I don't really consider myself although I have focused on politics and before that sports and before that travel writing at outside magazine, like I was never, I never thought of myself as a travel writer or a sports writer or a politics writer. Mm. I was just like a, somebody who wrote about things that I found interesting. And mm. so I'm more of a generalist and I, I still feel that way. And I, I'm just trying to convince my editor that that's true. Uh, so <laughs> I, I'm working on a story right now. Um, can't say too much about, but I hope it'll be out in the next month or maybe a month and a half, a long piece for the magazine that's about a brewery of all things. And it's about uh, a brewery where some murders have taken place um, in the United, yeah, in North Carolina. Um, still in and, existence, uh, still a work. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Very, very much so. It's going national. It's um, and, and what makes it especially interesting is they hire active rival gang members and they insist that the gang members remain in their gangs. Um, so it's this like sort of on the face of it, kind of this like social justice thing, yeah. but that doesn't exactly, it's not playing out the way that uh, they, they, they hoped it would. Um, wow. What's the brewery? And it's, it's super interesting. Um, it's called True Colors, and that's all I'll say about that for now. But uh, um, mate, um, I'm, I'm excited yeah. about that story. It's a very interesting story. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, if, if people want to follow your work, other than subscribing to The New Yorker and Outside, is there a good way for them yeah. to, to stay in touch? Sure, yeah. Um, I tweet a lot, probably more than I should. Mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, so at Charles Bethe, um, C-H-A-R-L-E-S-B-E-T-H. And uh, I'm on Instagram and happy to have followers there if people wish. Um, same, it's the same thing, at Charles Bethea, I think. Check. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's at Charles Bethea. Yeah, 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 at Charles Bethea. So, yeah, it's been well, fun, guys. Um, maybe I should try to run sub five. You guys have me thinking about it again. Yeah, yeah sub 530. That's not a story, is it? <laughs> it's not, am it's I a me. worse but am I less fit than I was 40, you know, when I was younger? Yes, yes, you are. Even if you get it, what does it prove? Nothing. It's got to be, can I live up to those, like, mid-20s ah, ideas? Ah, damn it. 
Damn it. All right. Okay, well. Or, or you can join the bet of me and another brewery, uh, the, the fan of Brewdog, who can run us 18-minute 5K first. That's going to be Ooh. our talent today. That's, yeah. you're, doing eight, you're doing that? That's, yeah, that's the plan. Once we've decided on the bet, I need to get not injured first, but yes. Because that was actually that that was my that was actually my goal right after the five minute mile was to do an eighteen minute five k, um, yeah. and I I I started training a bit and then got some like uh, knee issues and just whatever got distracted and never went back to it. But I I was I feel like I was in shape to run at least eighteen thirty. Um, I think if you I'd run a sub five. Yeah, I'd be surprised given that you were running sixty miles a week if you couldn't have just done the next Saturday and done it. I think you would. I have know. Been. I wish I had. I wish I had. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. But that's the story well, of all runners. You know, you train for a marathon, whatever it may be, and then you then go and drink and eat loads of cake. And you <laughs> then you get you forget that all the PBs that you wanted are just out there and just disappear away. Um, yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah. And yeah, it's if, you've got any, yeah, if you have any other running stories in the future, let us know because we'd love to have, to have you back. And cool. um, if you make it to the UK, or get in touch with Ryan. Give us a shout because we'd love to hear from you and from him. And, uh, yeah, stay in touch. Right on. All right, guys. We'll do. See ya. Thanks, Charles. Take care. Bye-bye. I love, I love getting journalists on. So um, they, know how to pitch, they know how to position their story, don't they? Yeah, they know how to position their story. They know how to be concise about it. They know what the at the, the the point of the highest drama is and the bits. Yeah, that, uh, yeah. They know they know how to structure it because that's what they did. It was interesting, just reminding me of actually that is exactly what it's like as a freelance journalist. You forget that. You forget that once you become kind of established within a or you get to know the editorial team that, that they feed you stuff. But up until that point. You are pitching shit to them. You're pitching any old thing to them in order to try and get it. You have to work really hard to do it. And then it does take a while. I mean, like, you know, nothing was of the level of um, sort of New Yorker magazine. Yeah, I wouldn't, yeah. wouldn't say Men's Running was on the you know, the level of New Yorker magazine or outside. But, but the, you know, there were a shitload of other people who wanted to, you yeah, know, wanted to write for it, of course. Yeah. And, um, but you do, you, you, you it, is, it is quite a privilege. Like, when you eventually get to a point where, like, they cut you know they come up with ideas and they're like they kind of throw them out to you and you're like oh yeah, yeah. Let's, do this idea, let's do this idea let's do this idea um but i think it's, there's definitely more of a propensity now to have more of those oh this so-and-so tried to do this time in 30 days you know there's a lot more of that it's a much more clear yeah. thing, it? and so it's you, you can see that because you're competing well, people... with youtube and, and everything else and there's loads of stuff like that on the on uh, you know all over the place I think particularly is on things like YouTube and, and even Instagram, people are, are desperate for content because they're not very good at necessarily coming up with good ideas, but it's always easy, easy to say, I try this and this is what happens. Um, <laughs> the payoff's never the, worth it, though. The payoff's never worth the nine. No. Minutes. You're like, oh, you didn't really achieve anything. Whereas that, like running a sub five, you know, I've, I've never done. It's yeah. hard. It's, it really, it's one of those things. It's just really hard to, to like, I can't understand that. To me, that doesn't like, because yeah. you like, it's not a four minute mile. And so I think, well, that's the kind of the pinnacle of four minute mile, isn't it? And yeah, you're under four minutes still. I got like, a five minute mile. I'm like, I have no real idea what, like what that, what that entails or what that means. It's, it's just really, really hard for, even for people yeah. who do any, do running to understand what some of these like even when he was talking about you know 400 meters oh yeah you need to do 74 second 400 meters like, <laughs> like, like yeah it, how long does it take to do 400 meters i can't i don't know that like most people don't yeah know that. that's, that's the thing isn't it so it all it's yeah just like, you might as well just be going oh yeah you might as well run a banana in a the a, a colander or something because it's just it's it just yeah because i'd i'd say we mentioned that marathon people have a, a more general understanding of but it's all it used to be that sub three was seen for men as like a a good like a decent club runner would run a sub three yeah that's all changed because of the shoes i don't know what it's now 255 250 whereas a mile isn't a distance that even clubs don't run miles they run 1500s and so it's not something that anyone knows from 
racing it it's something more you know from pacing per mile in your 5k or pacing your minute per mile for your training runs your tempo runs you know your minute per mile speed and so it's it's that awareness of like oh that's yeah all right so here's a question then um mm. which i never asked never thought about until until like a second uh, who came up with the different the, the choice that the the distances will be 100 meters 200 meters 400 meters 1500 meters why 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 those I've, i have researched 1500s before and i've forgotten it i think it's something to do with it's it's to do with yards or to do with the the difference between different measuring just have a quick google because yeah it, it is ridiculous that it's not just um 1600 meters a mile four laps um let's have a quick look in fact it's going to be boring for anyone on youtube watching us but we'll we'll let you know next week next week on the podcast oh my so, goodness um, look at us look at us like teasing like open loops oh my goodness we really the way this, this yeah the way this podcast works we'll let you know three or four weeks in advance as of releasing this remember. episode yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um but <laughs> when back... you remember or when you least expect it <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly but do do bad does anyone know ryan hall when we get him on the podcast i would love to who else has done a sub five? And what's what's a nice question? What would you say is the equivalent of a sub five minute mile in a marathon time? For reference, what do you think it is if you were to put it out there? Are we talking two forty fives? Are we two, talking two thirty fives? Two fifty fives? Post below or write to us. Let us know your, your estimate, um, just to get a sense of how hard people think it is. Because that almost tells you a lot about how we perceive the mile times and the marathon times and which ones are more impressive. Um, but we've, if you've liked this episode, please do subscribe. Please do rate, rate us because the reviews help us get in future guests like Charles. And if there's someone you'd like us to interview, an article you've seen we need to talk about, anything like that, then message me, David at Bad Boy Running, or letters at Bad Boy Running, message on Instagram. And if you want to ask questions to future guests, we didn't do it for Charles just because it was quite a specific topic um, about a specific story. But we normally ask questions based on the Instagram post. So follow us on Instagram and you can ask future guests questions that will relate, relate to them directly. And if you want to join the conversation, start the conversation, start a poll, answer a poll, um, spew whatever thought you want into the uh, great unknown world of running. Um, you can join the Facebook group and there's probably plenty of people that will abuse you um, of your opinions. So head over to uh, Bad Boy Running Podcast on Facebook, answer three questions and we'll let you in. Uh, if you want to buy merch and run around in red looking like an absolute dickhead, um, that's entirely possible as well. Or if you're at the running show, which you will have been by now, but if you didn't catch us at the running show, <laughs> you can still buy merch at store.badboyrunning.com. Um, thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next time.